Hello there, it's great to be here, albeit virtually. My talk today is going to be about augmenting cognition and in particular thinking about the design of the technology and the experiences that we're designing through using augmented reality. There's been a, a lot of research uh, thinking about how to augment uh, humans and the field human augmentation is very much about thinking about how we can use both medicine and also technology to enhance human abilities. And essentially there are, there are two design approaches. The first one, which is fairly common, is, is what I'm calling the compensatory approach, which is to design something that works, it's utilitarian, it functions, but often it can be ugly. There's not much thought gone into uh, how it's going to be worn or how it's going to be used in the context. The second approach, which is uh, where I think from a human-centered approach, is to think very much about how you are going to empower the individual. And to do this, to think about how do you design the technology, uh, particularly if it's a wearable, so that it's desirable, and of course that it's usable, it's easy to learn and easy to use, and often which is uh, overlooked is that it's stylish. Examples of uh, human augmentation include uh, you know, glasses and binoculars. Um, and speaking of glasses, I'm going to think about uh, the design of uh, glasses. Many years ago when the NHS, that's the National Health Service in the UK, uh, were thinking about how to design glasses for children. And they came up with a range which was pretty similar to the adults range, except uh, there were less choice and they had, uh, if you can look at the bottom here, the curly bit was made to be um, a bit more curvy so that it fitted around the ear and wouldn't fall off when the child was running around the playground. Um, these were provided free as part of the National Health Service, but the problem when they came out was that children felt very self-conscious and ashamed of having to wear glasses and there was a lot of stigma attached and they were called all sorts of names, for example, four eyes. And the, for the uh, early um, ranges, uh, glasses were designed for children, for girls that were um, actually pink. They had pink transparent frames like the one be below. And the, the idea here was that was to try and make them more flesh-like and less visible so that they somehow disappeared into the face. How different are things now? So nowadays, um, national health glasses are designed to be fashionable. They're made by designers and they are intended to be cheap and affordable and to be cool with many different colors. And um, they're not in designed to be hidden like the pink glasses we saw, but to be shown off and to be proud of. And nowadays, uh, many children wear glasses and it's not stigmatized anymore. It's just you know, the normal thing to do. Let's think about uh, uh, 10 years on, Google Glass, when that came out. There was lots of fanfare about how this new technology would extend uh, our powers and would allow us to um, interact with the internet uh, to be able to take uh, photos and, and videos, but also to be able to connect with the, with the internet and access directions and information when needed. Um, as you may well know, uh, unfortunately for Google, um, the, the Google Glass um, wasn't successful and it ultimately failed, uh, at least the, the first version here. And there were many reasons for this and I'm not going to go into all of those. But one of them is that it's quite ugly to look at. Um, it's also quite, uh, it was quite awkward to use. The usability was quite difficult. You had to uh, use um, speak commands, but also to use this uh, control on the arm of the, of the glasses. And uh, perhaps one of the biggest problems was that it was designed with the user in mind, not with the use context. And so when people started walking around with these in, they, they freaked many people out. They didn't quite know what was going on. And when you look at it up into Google Glass, what happens is the, the white of your eyes appears. And so it looks as if you're not looking at the person that you're talking with. So fine if you're just walking down the street by yourself, but once you interact with others, it became very uncanny and creepy. And to the extent that several bars and restaurants banned uh, the people wearing these glasses because of its effect on others. Now think 
eight years on, what have we got around the corner? We have Enreal glasses, and what's the big difference here? These are designed to actually look like sunglasses and to be worn like sunglasses. They don't look that different from some you know, very fashionable brands of sunglass. And uh, again, the idea here is to allow you to have access uh, to information, but it's augmented onto the real world in quite different ways from the Google Glass. And you'll have all seen the promotional videos of how that um, is going to work. So uh, it's a very different approach to thinking about the design of the wearables compared to previously. There are other uh, technologies that have been transformed from being sort of old-fashioned prosthetic devices to something that's uh, desirable and empowering. And in the early days, uh, there were braille readers that were designed um, and braille phones specifically for uh, people who are partially um, sighted or blind. And these were, again, something that was just designed for, for those users and could often be felt as if there was a stigma attached. Whereas when uh, the iPhone came along, you can see on the right just how empowering it was. They felt the same as everyone else. They had the same device. And they, there was also many apps designed to help them to access the internet and to navigate uh, using the phone. <clears throat> And other kinds of prosthetics, you can think about uh, artificial limbs or legs. These were, again, to begin with, designed to be functional, cheap um, and rather ugly. And in the last few years, we've seen quite different types of prosthetic devices, uh, namely the blades, which uh, look incredibly uh, sleek and very fashionable and have been designed with you know, specific purpose to empower uh, runners. So prosthetic design is changing how um, <clears throat> it looks and feels to be augmented, how, how we as you know, human beings and many fashion designers are now employed to create new limbs that are personalised, that the wearer can decide what sort of style uh, and design and shape and so on. And uh, this clinic, uh, they very much thinking that they're not trying to create real legs. Um, they're not trying to create them so that they look like a leg, but they're, they're actually saying, look, this is a prosthetic device and I'm very proud of it and it's very fashionable. And the idea here, again, just like with the more fashionable glasses, is to show them off rather than to hide them. So I think I've given you some examples of prosthetic devices that have been designed uh, and it's very much um, that we should be augmenting um, our cognition through good design and importantly uh, to empower people um, rather than to compensate for um, something that's missing. And part of doing this is that it can change our perceptions about how we see ourselves and others. And you saw that with the uh, partially blind people who had the iPhones. Now, can we start to create new social norms? It's acceptable to be wearing these technologies. And uh, that wasn't thought of for the Google Glass. Um, and also, uh, this is something that's more speculative, which is we can think about uh, if we're designing to empower, we could create um, new superpowers that are inclusive, that are designed for everyone to try out. Think about um, exoskeletons. Uh, these originally were designed uh, for use in manufacturing to ease the strain that workers have when lifting very heavy uh, machinery. And uh, as you can see, it's very utilitarian. It serves its purpose. But what would happen if you thought about designing them in a different way? We could design um, exoskeletons to be fashionable. And here, Jonathan Rossiter, who's a professor at Bristol University, he's designed um, leggings, exoskeleton leggings. And the idea here is to help all people, um, or it could be people who have difficulty, to be able to stand up, to lift objects and to walk. And the way in which these leggings work is that there are artificial muscles uh, made of bubbles that can expand and contract that are embedded in different parts of the leggings. There's also straps that you can see uh, at here and down here that automatically tighten. And this is what helps uh, to stiffen the material so that that can encourage uh, the person to, to stand up and to walk. And importantly, they're very fashionable and they're making a statement and they can be worn by anyone to experience new ways of walking. 
Now think about other uses of exoskeletons. Uh, we could be, um, they could be designed to uh, enable people uh, to, to uh, experience how it feels to be much taller um, and to walk around as if you're 10 foot tall rather than five or six foot. And whilst you can do this with stilts, this is making it much easier to do. And as you can see here, much more enjoyable and you don't fall over. There's been other uh, attempts to think about uh, superpowers and this one here is designed by Sophie de Olivier Barata and thinking about how do you create super limbs that change how it feels to feel and I think that's a really interesting um, existential uh, concept and here this uh, person has been given a 3D printed hand and it receives signals from electrodes in different parts of the body um, which then go into the harness at the top here and can help perform a variety of gestures. So these could be controlled by the user or they could be uh, controlled by someone else. And this is part of an alternative limb project uh, and to think differently. And so it's very much a, a thinking let's get a dialogue about how we design these uh, additional um, limbs um, and the way in which they're controlled and interacted with. Um, how can they be extended? How do people feel comfortable and how can we evolve them? So uh, I've been talking about different types of technologies that can empower us uh, through uh, various kinds of prosthetic device. Let's get back to uh, thinking about the conference here, which is how do we think about how to best design um, augmented reality or XR to augment um, cognition? Well, it can be functional as here. This is the windscreen of a car. This is perhaps one of the most successful uses of AR to help with navigation. Well, this can be in a car or a plane and it's been used now for a few years on, in high end range of, of cars. Um, it can also be fun and I'll give you some examples of that. But as I said, let's be thinking all the time, how do we um, use or design these technologies to empower people? So you're all familiar with this uh, filter from Snap. Believe it or not, this is five years old. This was the uh, reindeer vomit, reindeer, um, rainbow vomit uh, that came out and was very uh, popular at the time. And since then, well, there are many different kinds and types of filters um, that have uh, been developed, not just for Snap, chat but also for other applications and zoom in, is uh, in the last few weeks there are all sorts of um, fun filters you can use to liven up those rather dull zoom meetings and they're playful and fun but could we think about how we could use the front facing camera which is what this is based on to design um, applications for more serious use and a few years ago, I was involved uh, with the English National Opera and a company called Holition to think about how we might design uh, front-facing augmented reality to help uh, different people step into character and, and what would that mean. And this we worked with a, uh, for a particular opera uh, and thinking about how could you uh, uh, enable members of the audience uh, to step into the characters that were being portrayed. And it was called the Magic Mirror Project, and it was based on the opera called Agnarshan. So there's Agnarshan, and who was a pharaoh who believed only in one god, which was very different at the time. And this production was put on um, by Philip Glass, and it's uh, a very popular opera. And what we were interested in was thinking about how we could use AR to enable the makeup that's used uh, by these um, protagonists in, in the um, opera to um, to see if, if you, it, you could step into that character. So we designed um, the makeup for uh, Akhenashen and also his wife. Um, and we then set um, the application not to be just appear on a tablet or 
a phone, but it was set into this mirror. And it's the sort of mirror that you see in the dressing rooms uh, backstage with the bulbs appearing. And so we put this for a number of weeks into the dressing room uh, at the English National Opera at the Coliseum. And we asked a number of, of the singers and school children and makeup artists to try the virtual makeup on and to experience what it was like um, and to ask them questions about how they felt. And uh, what we found was that for the different user groups, uh, that they were all quite uh, you know, amazed by the technology. Bearing in mind this was uh, three or four years ago, so that was their first experience. And it says it makes you feel different. You feel like you are a different person. It changes you so quickly. And this was particularly the case for the, the lead singers who thought that it could be used. They could put them sit, sit in front of this mirror to get into character when they were doing the practice. Um, and during uh, lockdown, you can imagine just how useful this type of application could be is if you need to get into character to do your rehearsal. The makeup artist also saw huge uh, potential for being able to try out many different designs without it being costly. And school children, uh, some of them had never been to the opera, let alone try makeup on. And so for them, it, at first they were quite self-conscious, but afterwards they were quite incurious to think about what you know an Egyptian looked like and. Uh, and the makeup that was being used for this particular production. So it was a very successful uh, initial project into thinking about how you could use these types of filters, as they're known now, um, in these seri more serious educational contexts. So the design implications coming out of this project was that um, people are very forgiving. Um, so if they move their head suddenly and the eyebrows pinged off, they thought that was quite funny um, rather than it being a, a problem. So fidelity isn't key. That there likes to there needs to be interactivity. We had uh, options to try on the different makeup um, and go through different um, functions. And the element of surprise and control, so the user is in control, we found prolonged their engagement with it. And that it was really important to think about how you designed a real world um, context to facilitate that magic. So having the uh, app appear in the, in the mirror made it seem that more uh, authentic and, and, and magical. So what other ways can AR be designed to extend human cognition? This was me, by the way, in Jersey doing bird watching for the very first time and the first time I'd used one of these uh, prosthetic devices. Um, how about thinking of uh, mobile AR holograms? Uh, currently, myself and Anthony Steed are working um, with a company called HoloMe. Um, and they are developing uh, these holograms of whole people that are, can appear using mobile AR in your living room. And the question here is, will projecting whole body rather than just head and shoulders um, in, in someone's uh, space, physical space, extend how we connect with them? And imagine uh, if I uh, was not just sitting here in this virtual space, but um, I popped up in your actual home and gave the talks uh, and it was live streaming. Would you pay more attention to me if it was in that format than in this VR format? And we're looking into what it is about having, seeing someone, you know, 3D and from head to toe. And it looks like it could be that they, you know, they appear to be more immersive and more engaged. And what about um, how uh, AR, mobile AR can extend how we tell stories? This came out about a year ago and I found it was really intriguing because the AR wasn't uh, characters appearing in your space, but it was, a, it was a character appearing on the label. For those of you who haven't seen this, this is a, a wine company called 19 Crimes and these characters appear to start talking to you once you hold your phone up with, with the um, app. So let's just see what happens. So here's the app. Think that we have been nearly nine years in this living tomb since our first arrest and that it is impossible for mind or body to withstand the continual strain that is upon them. 
one or the other must give way. Well, the different types of wine all have different criminals who have their own stories. And it's probably one of the first adult AR applications that came out. And it really does look uh, or th you know, as if the label is talking to you. And it gives us a different way of thinking about uh, how we can tell stories. So it may not just be bottles of wine, but it could be medicine or it could be, you know, as we're walking past uh, um, in the supermarket, might be able to tell us uh, where the food has come from and so on and so forth in an exciting and authentic way. Um, what about mobile uh, AR with a bit of AI behind it? You've probably all seen this uh, Google Lens app. It's been around as well for about a year or two. And I think what this does is it can provide contextual information. So you take a picture um, and here it will automatically identify your friend's dog. And you can say, oh, look, it's a Labradoodle and then reel off facts about Labradoodles as if you knew that. And you can think about, in this could be done in all sorts of contexts to make us appear more knowledgeable. Um, and there could be all sorts of applications um, in educational and everyday life. So I've given an overview of some of the successful um, applications that AR have been designed for. Uh, we've seen how it's successful for navigation and I explained how it can be used for magic moments where suddenly something pops up and we can use that to change how we look and also how we listen. And then lastly, uh, I showed for narration, it can uh, allow characters to speak to us in context. So these are three, I think, of the main successful uses. There are lots of other uh, ways in which AR has been developed, um, um, but still very much, you know, I'd say in early days. What about in the future? Where do we see uh, AR or XR going? And I would say in the future that, uh, I'll, I'll use the term XR here, because that covers all of them, uh, could augment cognition in even more empowering ways, not just simply guiding us or telling us stories, but could actually you know, truly augment everyday cognition. And here are three ways uh, I think that our future directions lay. One is in terms of memory. I think uh, there have been quite a few attempts to use augmented reality to remind people, particularly those who've got poor memories or dementia. Um, and they've been quite uh, rudimentary to begin with, but I think in the future we might be able to develop more sophisticated um, tagging and annotation uh, mechanisms that will allow us to tag uh, the, um, the physical and virtual spaces by overlaying various physical objects with um, reminders or to say you know you've only half finished that task or you've you've only got two days left to finish that assignment or you choose um, as to how that might be used particularly for people who have very busy lives um, and they are constantly being interrupted it could be a way of thinking how maybe with just a gesture that the tag would come up and it could be spoken and then that's converted into an, a, a digital annotation. So I think there's, there's lots of opportunity for, for thinking about extending cognition in that way. Nudging is another one which again has been used through ambient displays and other technologies to nudge us to do something and that could be um, to uh, you know to take more steps and more exercise or to you know, to, to not do something or to do something. And here we can think about how we might design messages and what kinds and what, in what form that they might pop up at opportune times, particularly if we're wearing glasses rather than it being a phone. And then thirdly, mediating. This is something that I'm interested in exploring in my own research is how might we design digital agents uh, that can help in collaborative settings. They might pop up to suggest this could be uh, in uh, team meetings or it could be uh, in, um, uh, in schools, all sorts of settings where sometimes we might have disputes um, and it could help if someone else uh, is there and could bring to our attention certain kinds of information that might be helpful. But it's easy to get carried away uh, and just bombard our senses, as many of you who would have seen that video uh, from a couple of years ago where all sorts of advertising was appearing in the environment to the point where it became like an LSD trip. 
So how do we uh, prevent ourselves from getting too carried away about putting everything out in the environment? And this is where I think uh, bringing in um, some theories and design principles based on uh, external cognition might help. And a few years or many years ago, I worked quite a lot on looking at how to develop a theory of external cognition. And what do I mean by external cognition? Well, it's the interactions that take place between the internal and the external representations when we're carrying out various cognitive tasks. And often, uh, you know, cognitive theories have just thought about the mental processes and representations that happen in the brain. Whereas external cognition is very much thinking about how we interact with the environment and how that changes how we perform our tasks. And one of the key uh, principles is this notion of computational offloading. And this refers to the extent to which different external representations, this could be animations, it could be VR or AR, um, and the way in which they're designed can reduce or increase the amount of cognitive effort required to understand or reason about what's being represented. And I spent a bit of time trying to um, uh, operationalize this notion of computational offloading as design principles. And here are a couple, and there are many more that we can start to include, but one of them is this idea of cognitive tracing. So how do we allow users to externally manipulate and make marks on different representations? You know, how do they uh, gesture? How do they undo them? And so on. So this is like a classic uh, user interface problem, but thinking of it in terms of it being about cognitive tracing and helping people to remember and, and uh, to know where they left off in, in particular tasks. Another design principle is what I'm calling temporal and spatial constraining. And again, this is about how you can use constraints uh, in, in, in a physical or a digital space and also during um, you know, time to make key aspects more salient um, at, at particular key moments. Um, again, thinking very much about to use constraints rather than always offering choices. And I think that's often you know, overlooked is let's constrain more rather than um, uh, offer too many choices. Another uh, theory that we might like to look at is epistemic action. And this is something that David Kirsch and uh, Paul Malio uh, developed many years ago. And the idea here is to think about how we manipulate uh, aspects of the physical world in order to create intermediate uh, representations that we can use to solve a problem. And many of you must have played this game Tetris uh, before, where you see uh, a shape floating in the air coming down and you use that to work out where you imagine and you project where the best place is for it to go. So here it would be down before um, the line of blue squares would come down here, but it might be that it goes over there. And the point being here is that by looking at these external representations, we can solve the problem in real time. They could also be entry points into um, partially finished tasks. So we might leave a book open, we might put the keys by the door, we might have a set of AI, AR floating tags. And the key here is to think about what, which of these entry points and how to design for them in this um, XR world such that we know what they mean and uh, that they appear at appropriate times and we can delete them. So thinking very much about designing the, the user interface with these entry points. And we can then think about uh, new um, further AR design principles that can inform how to look ahead uh, and plan our interactions in the world. And I think that's probably one of the areas where there's most scope is to think about the, how we're planning in the future and how we can use the environment to help us. So just to conclude, uh, I've covered um, a range of aspects to do with how technology can be designed to augment cognition. And I've pointed out how it's important not to neglect uh, what the technology looks like. And if you make it fashionable, and fun and fit in with the context or the environment is more likely to be successful and, and worn. Um, and we can follow um, external cognition principles to think about how we design this space such that we don't overload, but we offload. And that we should always be designing to engage and to inform and to empower. 
And lastly, as I said, let's not just put stuff out there because you can, but let's think about how we offload cognition into the environment when we need it. And on that point, I'd like to say thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge all my colleagues at UCL, funding from these various places, Holomi, Ian O and Holishan.